Hello, my name is Ben. Hello, my name is Lucas. And we are your hosts of the Two Vague Podcast this week. One word, two hosts, stories, trivia, and video games. Lucas is joining me from hot Las Vegas. We're burning a little bit too much. I can relate, man. Over here in Arizona, it's similar. How are things going with you? Last time we spoke, you were working on your Game On Venture, and by the time this podcast is published, you will have had your first issue, right? Yeah, yeah. It's exciting times. The the uh, the Kickstarter was successful. Our first issue will be out uh, officially on the 15th of July, and uh, already hard at work for the second issue. So I'm, I'm very excited, very humbled by all the encouragement and support. Other than that, uh, just staying indoors, as you and I both know. Uh, you know, <laughs> I always tell people I'm okay with the heat, but I would just rather not set heat records. Like that, that's kind of where I draw my line. So, yeah, and this is the, something that I didn't even think about until somewhat recently when I got into a discussion with someone about AI. Is the carbon footprint of where those computers are that are actually powering these server farms? Does that have an impact with crypto, depending on where those servers are located? There is a concern, but let's just be thankful that we both have air conditioning and not swamp coolers. Thankfully, air conditioning, knock on wood, uh, is in good working order. Hopefully it stays that way. (laughs) Yes. uh, Because you know it's always the summer when they fail. (laughs) Exactly, the power concerns. One other thing with Game On, the link that I had from last time was sort of a assortment of links have you updated that to include game on it should be in there but also if they just go to gameonmedia.net might be the the simplest way if they want to take a peek and and learn more excellent yeah so it's uh, gameonmedia.net correct you're going to be publishing bi-monthly what is the schedule going to be for your page here so the actual magazine is is starting as a monthly digital magazine uh, but there will be other articles on the website more frequently than that. But the actual magazine product is monthly. Okay. And is one free and the other paid or there's a subscription for access to all things? The articles will be free online and then the magazine is $5 a month. And then you just sign up through that web page, yeah? That's correct. So just recently, uh, I was able to announce that I am joining a website called Skills Hub as a podcast coach. Yes. Uh, So I'm excited about that. Uh, So that it's it's an on-demand coaching site for voice actors, podcasters, that kind of thing. Uh, And then we'll also be developing a course that will be out later in the year. Wow. So you're getting at the ground floor developing this course for... People who are excited about or interested in podcasting as a hobby or as a a job or both? Kind of both. So I think we're still working with their team to develop what exactly they are looking for from it. But my vision right now would be that it starts kind of from right from the beginner. So somebody looking to pick this up as a hobby who maybe haven't podcasted before Mm -hmm. uh, with future courses, lessons, I don't know what you want to call it, taking the deeper dives into the minutia and Uh, when podcasting starts to become a little more serious from a hobby into something you want to pursue, perhaps professionally. Yeah. Modules, I think, is what uh, you would call. Yes, good call. call. (laughs) (laughs) Modules. How clinical. Modules. (laughs) So that's exciting stuff, man. Did you get involved with this through Jennifer Hale? Is that how you got it? Or is this something that the independent of that? Because I know that Jennifer Hale has some voice acting stuff that she does with that site too yes uh so jennifer along with karen and bill co-founded the site in my previous podcast uh we had had jennifer on a couple times and she's such a nice person you know super kind and genuine we had kind of just kind of kept in touch on the, some of those episodes we had asked her about skills hub uh, and so we just kind of kept that conversation going in the background and the three of them uh, expressed some interest in expanding into the podcasting world on their site. And uh, when it made sense for them, they kind of asked if I was interested and uh, we had a couple meetings to see if we were a good fit. And looks like they they were willing to take a chance on me and, and uh, we're here. Nice. Very nice. I'm excited for you. You got a lot of a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak. Oh, thank you. It, it you know it, it's funny when when I left my previous job, it definitely became a uh, 
well, I better piecemeal <laughs> some extra income together in the meantime while things kind of steady themselves out. Uh, so it's been a pretty interesting experience. But a bright future, I think, here. Podcasting as a hobby is something that helped me through some difficult times and something that I'm enjoying, although not doing it for income at this point. But some people focus on the income part of it. And others just focus on the hobby portion. It, it's interesting because when, when I had co-founded my previous podcast, it was right before the pandemic. And yeah, it's interesting when you say that, that like podcasting really played a big role in, in helping me through, especially those early days of the pandemic, just if nothing else, giving me a, a way to connect with people and, and a sense of normalcy. So it's something that's near and dear to my heart, man. It, it's played a big role and kind of developed me as a person to, to who I am. Yeah, that passion will definitely show through those courses, I think. I know that you're excited about video games, but it sounds like you're also excited about the whole podcasting thing as well. It's a great community, like super supportive. Like, like I, I tell people, it, it's one of the best communities out there. Agreed. So let's get into the news. I, I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> the word this week is the word news. The issue isn't out yet, but do you have any breaking, breaking? Oh, that bugs me. When people use breaking stories, right? breaking doesn't mean the same thing anymore no it doesn't a breaking story as a journalist should be news that is happening that you're covering real time right is that right okay and that is a breaking news story not something that has happened recently that is finalized it is news that is in process it is a story that's in process but do you have any things that you want to share that are coming up in Game On that are articles that you worked on that you're kind of proud of the subject matter? Or when we talked before, you were focused on the fact that you want to bring news stories and focus on journalism, right? Right. Since it's a monthly magazine, I would say it's less about like the breaking stuff and less about the daily news grind, obviously, just given the, the release cadence. What I would say is is we're trying to just take deeper dives into to stories and issues and topics. Mm -hmm. So for this first issue, our main story is Evo, which is the big fighting game tournament series out here in Vegas. They cracked 10,000 unique competitors this year, which is the largest single esports tournament now in history. Oh, wow. You know, our second issue, we're, we're diving right into AI and game development. So we're taking some swings at uh, topics that deserve a longer look since we have the space to and we can take our time with it. And so like even the, the AI stories, we're splitting that up into a couple parts. Uh, one with AI and voice acting and one with AI and game development, mm -hmm. uh, just so we can give that conversation room to breathe. We have stories coming up on gaming and esports in the education space and what that is looking like and how they're trying to shape that into something productive uh, and helpful for the future generations. Also working on a, a longer term story, a, a little bit about the, the state of the gaming industry at large, talking to both current developers, past executives, and getting a variety of, of viewpoints on, on where we stand today. It's definitely a space to have a conversation about topics that I think need to be talked about in, in a much more nuanced way than we have been. Yeah. And it seems like there's a lot of editorials, people editorializing more than bringing you the facts. Right. I think we talked about this on our last show, how that is important, presenting as much of a balanced viewpoint as you can so someone can make that decision on their own where they stand that is still the focus correct it is yeah i um i think i mentioned this last time is as i'm i'm very much an old school reporter at heart where i trust that my audience is intelligent and smart enough to make up their own minds it's my job to present it as full and fair of a, a picture of of a topic as i can and trust that they will figure out what they need to figure out from it personally. When you're writing a news story, the purpose of a title of a news story is to inform what the story is about. And I see a lot of titles of articles and what they do with those titles is they will do something to grab your attention and then not give you the information until towards the end of the article kind of thing. One of my news pet peeves is, Listen, I've only got a limited amount of time. If you're telling me this article is 
what is the optimal temperature for your apartment during heat waves? Don't give me all this stuff. And then at the very end, is that something that in digital you want clicks, right? Is there a reason people do that for printed stuff where they will wait until the end? My sense is that it's just because they're taking their digital files and placing it into their print design. Mm. Previously, you know, in an ideal situation, you might have a digital version of the story that might be like the quick hit uh, of a, a, a new story that kind of gets updated throughout the day. Right. And then like a print version of the story that's kind of fleshed out or the final form of a story. I don't think that happens as much anymore, partly due to staffing issues. So like I think previously you might have a lot of news organizations that had digital reporters, print reporters, and, and can kind of coalesce around that. Whereas I think more and more commonly as staff layoffs have hit the industry, you just have a smaller pool. So that digital file becomes your print file. Whereas when you're writing digitally, you know, part of it is not just the click rate. It, it's how much time they're spending on a file and on a particular story. So they might be rearranging things because they're trying to get you to spend more time reading it. Then it doesn't get reordered for print because they don't have the staff for the time. Hmm. Okay. That's a priority sort of calculus that's happening there is they want you to stay on the page yes yep interesting yep, yep. you say you're old school it's like when i would read a paper back in the old days right give me the news give me the facts and then if you want to put all the background and stuff later on in a paper you want efficiency i think you wanted to be able to look at that and get your information right up front and then get the supporting details if you're interested in the rest below but that has changed yes that's my sense you know you're right that in, in in the past it's hey you better get all your facts in the lead because a reader might read two to three paragraphs down and that might be it however just from what i've seen and i wasn't directly involved with the advertising stuff but i know that time spent per article is a metric that advertisers look at so it's it's just changed a little bit that's the digital age the growth and the changing of the industry. So before we get into the definition of the word news, what have you been playing? <laughs> oh man, my go-to like relax game is is and still Animal Crossing. That's the game I'll just log on when I need to like unplug my mind, uh, so to speak, and and just kind of kick back. Okay, uh, I've actually been trying to go through my backlog as of late. One game that was that that I'd always wanted to play that was sorely lacking is i went back to play child of light <laughs> which i know is an old game yeah. uh i don't know how i just missed it it was always kind of on on my radar loving it i'm gonna dive back into the fallout games because uh i know i was late to this but recently had finished the fallout series in amazon right uh so i'm excited to to dive back into that you were playing some sort of gashapon kind of game before that was a marvel themed Oh, Marvel Snap? That's still there, man. It's still there. Okay. <laughs> it's, you know, I'm a sucker for card games. <laughs> I, I, I just am. And like I said, Marvel Snap matches are so short that it, it's such a time suck. You can justify in your mind just one more game. It's not going to take that long. And then an hour later, you're like, oh, what did I do? <laughs> so that's, that's definitely still there. I, I, I think they've, they've done a great job with uh, releasing new sets and whatnot uh you can still get started and not have to sink a, a penny into it for for a very long time i do think it's gotten to the point though if you want to be like super competitive you do need to start sinking some money into it you know, a pay to win kind of thing right right but i think casually gaming that i think you're still fine and it's a lot better than physical card games i had gotten into lorcana which is still a fun card game but my goodness i hate like how they release new sets every like three months i think it is now and mm. you just have to pause so i don't get sucked into that vortex right right well i think i told you this i don't know if you saw the trailer or I, yes i told you about the wife quest game that i'm playing <laughs> this game called <laughs> wife quest by pippin games on the last show, we talked about, I think it's my third code for a game that was called Tevi. 
and it's a platformer game, which is available, I think, on all the platforms now. I think it's available on Switch and also on the PlayStation 5 is where I played it, where I got the code for it. It's a very fun platformer that is kind of nostalgic. Mm -hmm. After I completed that, I was looking through the suggestions and I saw this Wife Quest game and I was like, okay, what is this? Right. <laughs> 20 bucks on the PlayStation. And, and so I was, I was like, eh, I don't know. And then when I went over to Steam, two bucks, two bucks on Steam. Oh, man. So I was like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to play this uh, for comedy purposes. And it is a very old school, kind of like what you would play on a handheld type of platformer. It's got some Castlevania Metroid sort of elements to it, but it's mostly just a platformer. You play as Mia, who is a former warrior who now lives with her farmer husband, Fernando. What happens is the there are some witches that keep on abducting Fernando so they can have their way with him. And so you have to go on a quest to save Fernando from all these very buxom women demon people who want to have their way with Fernando. <laughs> it's a wife going on a quest. It's not a quest for a wife, right? But you see wife quest, and I think the first thing you think of is like, you're looking for a wife. <laughs> not bad so far. The boss fights are very reminiscent of those old school Nintendo style games. It's got that feel to it. Very arcadey feeling. So well worth the two bucks so far got past a couple of the bosses one of the bosses you fight early on is a fairy and you rip off her wings so you can use them <laughs> it's, it's a yeah, very strange story but then the other game that i'm playing is a new release did you ever get into any of the geshen impact stuff you know i haven't no the, the company mihoyo i think is how you pronounce it just released a game called zenless zone zero it's available on the phone, but then also your higher end systems. I've been toying with that a little bit. I brought up the whole Gashapon model and pay to win because this is like there are so many different currencies and you go to the page. It's got the different characters that you can buy or the different things that you can use. It's all about money. You can buy the packs of things. Why do you think that that is such a popular model as far as development is it all about the money i think so um i think there's also the appeal to consumers that usually then there's either no or very low cost to initially buy in mm. just from a psychological standpoint it feels like oh hey i can start i can play this game for free or you know for a couple bucks right i think it's similar to like card games right each transaction might only be a couple bucks, so like it doesn't hurt in your mind, right? You can be like, oh, cool. You know what? I'll just throw another five bucks at something. And it's, it's much easier to spend more than you would have for a full price release very quickly. From a developer standpoint, that's also then a very steady source of income longer term than the initial upfront buy-in. Plus, as they keep releasing more and more content, it's a much longer tail for them on the income side. But if you think about it, it's a big risk. There are people like yourself, you've been in that Marvel universe for how many years? A couple years now? Yep, yep, yep. This same company, like I said, did Geshen. And there's the new thing that's coming out, but you only have so much time to play these games. Right. You've got a lot of companies who fail at this too, as far as the model. It just seems like it's one of those, you have to have the right game at the right time. It's a tremendous risk. The reward is you've got a source of income that's very consistent. Right. But the risk is you've spent a lot of time developing this thing that no one's playing. Yeah, that's true. I, it's similar in nature to like a live service game, right? If you can nail it, if you can draw in your audience, you're set. However, how many live service games have we seen come and go and, and fail spectacularly sometimes? Right. But I, I think it's just one of those things where they must look at the risk and go, yes, but if we can hit it, the reward's too great to not take a chance on it. And by reward, they mean money. Their financial gains will be so great if it works that... You know what? Hey, why not roll the dice? And this Endless Zone Zero, 
I can play on both. I've got my account linked on my phone so I can do all the collection stuff, all the rearranging and leveling up of my characters on my phone. It's exactly the same game on my phone. By the way, I don't know what kids today are eating that allow them to read tiny print, but my God, (laughs) I can't read this. I've got to take a picture of the thing and, and then zoom it in and may just be me getting old but my conspiracy theory is that eyesight's just getting better and we're like the not as evolved <laughs> form oh geez <laughs> i don't like that um this is a game that feels like the phone game while i'm playing it on the higher end system it looks like a high-end system game It's got a lot of action. It's sort of got this very flashy look that reminds me a lot of Jet Set Radio, kind of like that kind of cel-shaded, cartoony characters. But it's an action-oriented game that's got these little bits where you're navigating through a maze, but you unlock characters as you go through, and then you have to buy their weapons and develop their skills and all this stuff. So they've got a lot of things built into it. I don't know how much longer I'm going to continue playing it, though. It just doesn't scratch that itch for me. So I don't know. We'll see. I usually go through one of these games that are trying to get you into the ecosystems that you stay with for usually about a year, and then it's like I find something new. So... I don't know if Zenless Zone Zero does it for me. I mean, maybe if it was a game by itself and it had a more compelling story and it wasn't pelting me with all this, hey, buy this new thing. And then you've got these 17 different currencies that they all do different things. And some of them are free currencies and some of them are paid currencies. And it's just too confusing. But it's a trend that I don't see it stopping anytime soon. I agree with you there. I think every major success just feels more people in the industry to give it a try. Yeah, but that's what I've been playing. I think the wife quest is the more... (laughs) It sounds hilarious. I'm not going to lie. And as she beats the characters, you get these like silly finishing move type of things where you tug on them and then you can hear their neck crack. And it's like, like, what? (laughs) Yes. Yikes. But anyway, the word this week is the word news. I would be remiss if I didn't mention some news stories, but we'll do that after we do the definition of the word news. How's that? Okay. Definition of the word news. According to Oxford Languages, noun, newly received or noteworthy information, especially about recent or important events, a broadcast or published report of news, Informally, information not previously known to someone. Also informally, a person or thing considered interesting enough to be reported in the news. So those are our definitions of the word news. Surprise, surprise, the Google Ngram viewer. Consistent increase in usage in print from the 1800s until today just continues to go up. The origin of the word news, late Middle English, plural of new, a translating Old French novellus or medieval Latin nova, new things. So that is the origin of the word news. News has a component that is factual, but it's also information. Where do you think editorial comes into that? as far as the formula for what news is, does it have a place? Does perspective have a place in the news? Let me start by saying, yes, in an ideal state, news should be unbiased, right? Right. I'm also a realist of saying it's impossible to eliminate all bias, no matter how hard you try. It's going to show up a little bit, right? We're humans. I think perspective is important in certain stories to give context, Mm -hmm. uh, to give a sense of a topic's importance within a a subject matter. So, yes, because, I mean, human perspective shapes what is important, right? Or what meaning we can find of it or what we should take away from something. Where the danger is, is when we let our perspective drive a point instead of driving the conversation. You're talking from an integrity standpoint, right? Yes, If something happens in subject matter A, right, 
we might have years and years of, of perspective and context to place that in and, and kind of figure out why it's important once new and whatnot. That is important, but I don't want then my perspective to say, but you should think this. Like, I don't think that's that's our place. Is that news? That's the question. Unfortunately, it's presented as news. Yes. So, no, but there's a big part of me that thinks we've lost that battle. <laughs> I think there are people who think things are news when they're editorials. There's a difference between an editorial and factual news reporting. Yeah. I think perspective of the author is important in an article, but you can still remain somewhat unbiased. Somewhat. Right. When you're when you're writing this stuff. So how prevalent is bias in the video game industry specifically? We can talk about politics and political news channels or whatever, but let's stay away from that and let's talk about the video game industry specifically. Is that happening in that industry? I think the video game news industry is is an interesting case study. Now, let me start by saying there are plenty of amazing journalists out there, right? Right. Jason Schreier might rub people the wrong way, but I don't think you can argue that he gets stories, right? I acknowledge and champion that there are amazing gaming journalists out there. Absolutely. But I think on the whole, gaming journalism is in a really weird spot still to this day because you have a lot of, I'll call them mainstream journalism sources that don't understand the industry. Mm Mm-hmm. And so they they either still have old and antiquated views about like gamers living in their parents' basement, or they just don't understand the industry, so they talk down to them a little bit, or they're just wildly off base because they don't have a full picture of what's going on. Yeah. Uh, however, I th- I do the the other thing that complicates things is gaming journalism. I think is one of those that's most affected by content creators who act as journalists Mm, okay i think it's because i certainly watch streamers right i watch content creators so like i feel like the gaming audience has has been brought up watching content creators trusting certain content creators and so i think you see some content creators acting as journalists slash journalist advocates for certain issues and i think audiences have learned to think of that as news Mm. uh so so i think gaming journalism struggles with we need more journalists who are passionate about games who understand the industry but can also bring journalistic standards to their work but we're fighting against like i said not just other journalists who are doing a bad job we're fighting against the the whole creator economy too and i think that is a function Of the fact that gaming journalism, as it exists today, developed during the time of social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just grew tremendously along with technology. When I was reading Electronic Gaming Monthly or whatever the magazine was back in the day, it was well before that kind of ecosystem existed. I think of those folks who do the content creation in general as personalities. But someone who watches more biased sources of news could mistake that for a news source. I think for for us older people, uh, (laughs) I think uh, a good example is the host on cable news. I would argue most of those are talk shows or opinion shows, but they're presented on these cable news channels, all of them as, quote, news programs. Right. So I think... For the younger generation, a lot of these content creators is like the evolution of that. If you take a step back, you go, no, that's actually just their opinions. And they're not really like they they're, they don't need to. They don't have to hold themselves to, to journalistic standards, but they're just they're just talking about their opinions, how they feel about a, a subject matter. Right. Uh, I don't think that's wildly different from what we're seeing on cable news. So I just think it's that for the younger generation. And I don't think that's necessarily the fault of the content creator either. Right. That someone takes whatever they're putting out there as news. They don't have a lot of control over how someone interprets that. Some of them do it intentionally. Some of them do it for clicks. But I like to think in general, they're not complicit in the whole affair and they just are presenting this stuff and someone else is taking it and regarding it as news. 
I will say too that the the other challenge that gaming journalism has is just a lack of established gaming news outlets. Mm-hmm. Um, what was that? A couple a month ago, a couple weeks ago, when IGN Entertainment bought up all those gaming news sites, which I think is scary for a couple reasons. One is there were some layoffs, uh, which is is never never great. But also, if you have an issue with the way IGN runs things, well, now they're in control of a ton of other news sites Mm. that you would have to imagine are going to be run similarly. You know, I grew up reading IGN, Kotaku, Game Informer. None of those organizations look the same as they did. I think that a lot of people would argue that in at least two of those cases, things have taken a turn for the worse in a lot of areas. Uh, so I also think that hurts gaming journalism overall is the 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 established gaming news legacy brands have struggled, which journalism as a whole has dealt with, right? Legacy brands struggling to adapt, change, uphold standards, all that. But I, I, the, the difference is in traditional media, you have a million different outlets you can try and find. You know, in gaming journalism, there's not that many. As you were saying that, I kind of thought about, you know, AI is a big subject in not only gaming, but other tech companies. Recently, I read an article in the local news in Mountain View, California, the Silicon Valley, where everyone knows where all the silicon grows. The Mountain View based into it laid off or is planning to lay off 1,800 employees as a part of an AI-focused reorganization plan. So if you read this article, their CEO in an email said that there would be more than 1,000 layoffs of employees that were not meeting the company's elevated expectations, which just seems oddly vague to me, but whatever. But then into its website has sort of their plan for AI as far as a business plan is concerned. And they say some things like they're going to rehire these folks who are more focused on the AI portion of helping businesses. Uh, This is just me summarizing it. Now, Mm -hmm. you as a journalist, I have seen some articles online that sound like they have no voice and they sound like they've been generated by an AI. I don't know how to explain it. I've also found on Google, they've got these little blurbs where they will give you the TLDR on a full article or something right. just by summarizing. As a journalist, how much of a threat do you think there is for that in journalism? Not gaming journalism specifically, but journalism as a whole. How is AI going to change journalism? You would have to be naive to think that it's not a major threat to a lot of people's jobs. The issue being the Gannettes of the world that own, you know, like a ton of the the newspapers across the country will always look for ways to save money and cut costs. The danger is they're going to look at AI and go, AI can pump out the game recap story. AI can pump out the basic news story of whatever. So why do we need to keep X number of reporters employed when AI can do it? We can save so much money. I think it's foolish. Journalism, kind of like the gaming industry, has already seen tons of layoffs over the years. So it's foolish to think that that won't continue. The danger for consumers and audiences is if that becomes so widespread that that starts replacing, you know, investigative teams or the reporters that that are responsible to, to... holding local politicians accountable. Right. AI is not at that point. You know, AI can't do an investigative piece. You know, the AI can't probe, you know, questions and, and try and, you know, hold people to account. If it gets to that point, then journalism is in way deeper trouble than they are now. That's not to say that I don't think, like, I, I, I'm not okay with them getting to the point where they're replacing even, you know, new reporters because they think AI can do the, the basic news stories. I don't think that's right either. But... If it expands even beyond that, man, the industry's in in some deep, deep trouble beyond what it is today. And here's the thing that I think that's also missing. Maybe this is a part of me and yourself being old school, quote unquote. There were people who wrote articles in a paper or in a magazine that I would go to because I wanted their perspective. I enjoyed their writing style. I thought that they presented the news in a way that was digestible or whatever. 
there had to be a face or a person to connect with this for me. And I don't know, like we talked about earlier with the way the landscape is changing as far as the way we absorb or ingest or ingest, you know, the way we, the way we get our news as a society has changed. I think we're safe as long as we have that human connection where it's like, I like the articles this guy does, or I like the news stories that this person broadcasts or talks about. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we're safe, where we're not is all this extra kind of summary sort of stuff. AI is far, far away from being creative or even factual writers at this point. They can't even determine what I'm going to type out when I type out a sentence, <laughs> let alone ask questions. I don't know. For the longest time, I thought AI was just a buzzword that people were using to say, hey, look, we're high tech. But now it's starting to hit home because companies are starting to invest in it. And it's only a matter of time before news outlets do that as well. I apologize if this sounds self-serving. I am a reporter anyway at heart. So right. <laughs> two things that AI can't do is say I'm doing a, a sports beat, right? I may cover a team and I may just have game recaps for a couple months, right? But I'm building that rapport with the coach, with the players, with the goal. Part of my responsibility as a reporter is to build those relationships with my sources. So down the road, when something happens, they can be like, hey, you might want to take a closer look at X or, you know, hey, let me give you this angle for a story that I haven't told anyone else. No one else has. That part AI can't do because obviously there's not that interaction. The other thing, too, is AI might be able to do like the summary stuff, but they can't pivot. Right. I once did a story. It was when I was in college. It was a, a student boxer. Right. Come down, do the interview. We're talking about the boxing thing. Well, midway through the interview, he starts talking about Hacky Sack. And I'm like, okay, well, interesting. What got you to Hacky Sack? Turns out he had turned to Hacky Sack to help him break a drug addiction. Oh, yeah. I'm like, well, my story's changing. <laughs> like, And that's something that AI can't do, right? You can give it instructions. You can give it the facts. But it can't recognize, hey, that other angle might be more compelling. Mm -hmm. Let me shift. So, like, those are the things that I think... That obviously, uh, in addition to just the, the all the other human factors that we'll miss if they turn to AI. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit on previous episodes with Andrew. He has this obsession with AI art. And the problem with AI art is one of the things of art, what it is used for is expression. AI can't express their emotions or their connections or feel. So... What makes us think that they can put up something that connects? It may accidentally connect with someone, but you can't question an AI why they did this amazing story on this person who broke his drug addiction. Right. You can't ask an AI why they switched because they wouldn't. They would just go, right. this is the story I'm supposed to do. AI is seeping into things very quickly and companies are developing. But I think at some point we got to step back and focus on the building blocks of this and not be, there's a part of this that reminds me a lot of Jurassic Park. The whole, you were so focused on seeing if you could that you didn't stop and think whether or not you should. I'm not pretending like I know the answers, but I feel like if we don't, as a society, figure out what the rules and the boundaries and regulations are for AI now, we can't put the cat back into the bag down the road. Yeah. Like, it has to happen now. Like, whatever happens, whatever decisions are made now is going to determine what happens with AI. Yep, that is the truth. Yeah. And and I'm interested to hear your, your perspectives on, on your AI articles as it relates to specific areas of the gaming industry but then also going forward i mean it has a lot of potential i i think there's a there are great things that ai can do in the world of predictive scientific things like mapping the human genome or weather related predictions something that you know things that have large amount of data that need to be analyzed those are things that ai is really good at why are we focused on things that are creative? I don't know. It's all money, I guess, in the end. I hate to be cynical, but I suppose that's the, that's the answer. You're right, man. And, and, 
It's not like creatives have enough to deal with, right? <laughs> right. Right. Let me see here. What's a news story that we can shift this subject a little bit before we close out the show? Oh, apparently Bioware, uh, this is in IGN, teases full nudity for Dragon Age Veilguard. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I will say this. You bringing up IGN just kind of spurred me a little, little bit here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, earlier this year we had the, the Xbox layoffs. Yeah. Um, and then during IGN's Game Fest, Summer, Summer of Gaming, I, f- I forget... I apologize. I forget what IGN branded their their summer event, but they had the interview with Phil Spencer. Right. And I like pretty much already knew coming in we weren't going to get any real answers from Xbox because that's kind of they were just circling the wagons at that point. But I also think that it was a little troubling for me to see IGN agree to that. I certainly understand that if they didn't agree to that, I'm guessing Xbox would have said, okay, well, we're pulling out of the interview, right? I mean, they pulled out of other interviews with other outlets around that time. But, and I I know that this is easy for me to say because I don't have, like, I don't have to deal with massive audiences. I don't have to deal with reaching ridiculously high benchmarks, I assume. Mm -hmm. But as a a journalist, uh, I don't think I would agree to an interview like that. Like, there needs to be an openness um Mm -hmm. now you might as my interview subject you might say i'm gonna stonewall you right i'm not gonna answer your questions but you can't like i it 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 bothers me that ign didn't push (laughs) like that's that's where that's where it bothers me well i mean was it softballs is that what i mean were were the questions just little it it was mostly softballs. Like they, I think they asked one or two questions about the loss, but there were like no follow ups. No offense to people who play softball, by the way. I, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to belittle softball. It's a very important uh, pastime. Anyway, that's the thing. There's an integrity piece that, especially in IGN's case, that's in question here. I think that's where your Kotaku's and other outlets were trying to get to the root of those things. I do have some concerns as far as people promoting their beliefs as fact, but right. there's a sweet spot where it's like you can question. And one of the questions that I asked with the layoffs and closures was Hi-Fi Rush was an amazing success by all accounts. Right. Why did you close the studio? And no one seems to be giving a straight answer on that. I understand from Xbox's perspective, they're going to circle the wagons the best they can. However, gaming journalists shouldn't be okay with that. Yeah, especially with Hi-Fi Rush, right? You know, Matt Booty came out on Twitter defending Hi-Fi Rush in, in the past going, you know what? It's met expectations. We're happy with the performance. Right. If you were happy with the performance, if you said it met expectations, what happened? <laughs> like, <laughs> Give us the details. There's got to be a reason. It can't just be to save money. And if it is to save money, say it's to save money. That's a valid reason. Right. It's like, yeah, we know they were successful, but we're spending our money on this thing. And it just seems like it's wishy-washy politician kind of answers instead from a personal experience and i'll I'll also preface by saying i'm sure a part of this had to do with that game on magazine's a new outlet but uh one thing you won't see in this first issue is anything about the esports world cup and i had reached out to them and i was trying to see if i could set up an interview and they wanted to know the topics to which i said i will not share specific questions but i will share general topics that i'd like to start with and some of that is the controversy that's surrounding it. Right. After that, I was quickly denied. And so there's, there's nothing about the Esports World Cup in my in my <laughs> issue. As something like that, you can also pitch a thing where it's like you're investigating not with the consent of the outlet. You run the risk. I mean, it's PR that they are concerned with. But if you're a news outlet, that's not your job. You're promoting something, you know, you're... Who's to say if the story paints the thing in a positive or a negative light? Press is press. And I would argue that like if you're if you're saying no because it could potentially be negative, that seems like you're hiding something worse. <laughs> like I don't know if that's true or not. Oh but no, like, no, it's almost certainly true. <laughs> it's, 
as a journalist, as a, a professional journalist, it's my responsibility not to just come at you, right? Right. Like, that's that's not what we're supposed to do. But we're also not supposed to ignore the perhaps more controversial aspects of it because it's news, because people are talking about it, because some people won't participate because of it. Right. And that impacts all involved. So this is kind of a new thing for you, or have you had this experience when you were with the Las Vegas Journal where you ask someone for you know, you want to do a story on them, but they deny you. Is this something new to you now that you've got your own outlet? It might have happened once or twice when I was with the Review Journal, but not not often. This one, though, was the, the, the first, like, super blatant one. <laughs> like, like, I would say... And it's a new perspective for you, too, because this is your livelihood, right? Right. I feel like in the past, I might have had suspicions. That's what they were doing. But they were say they would say stuff like, oh, our schedule is too full right now. Or, you know, they were smart enough not to say it. This was the first one where they're just like, OK, well, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> right. So like there wasn't even the, the white lie. Yeah. So that part of it's new. <laughs> mm. Now that that had happened, are you planning on still doing a story on it? Do you think? Yes, it's just going to change. So because we're a monthly publication, I'm not interested in like the actual results necessarily. People will get that if they want it. I am interested after the fact to see how it ran to to try and and uh, hopefully get some some candid uh perspectives by some of the competitors and and whatnot of course i will offer to the up top organizers again because that's only fair but i am interested to talk to people once the whole thing's over and and they can we can all kind of digest what happened yeah we can give some time for it to marinate or or whatever too as far as decisions i mean it's you know it's still a fresh controversy, isn't it? It is. It's a question that has no easy answer, right? Like, if you're an esports organization and you see these massive, massive, massive prize pools, that's hard to not compete, right? right. Like, we'd like to think we can all hold to like these these really high ideals. If you have a family to feed and somebody dangles a million dollars in front of you, yeah. Eh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. People don't know how they'll respond to that until they're put in that situation, which would. It's one of those indecent proposal kind of deals, right? Right. All through my career, I said, I would never do cable news, right? I'm like, nope, nope, I would not. I would not cut back on my journalistic ideals. Now, if somebody offered me like the kind of money that Matt Lauer was making, which was, I think, in the neighbor of like five to eight million a year. I am at least thinking about it. Like, <laughs> I, like I'd like to just be honest. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> My integrity does have a price. It's a very high price. It, it depends on the situation, right? If I can set my family's future for life, I uh, that would be it, it changes things, right? So I am not saying that I'm coming at this like going like everyone who participated is wrong. I would like to understand the reasoning kind of and see how like how they like the experience and, and whether they thought it was worth it. That's really an interesting puzzle as a journalist. One thing that I didn't ask you up front that I usually ask people is what is the first thing you think of when you think of the word news? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give two different answers, because one is obviously a selfish answer, considering that I'm in the process of launching a news outlet. <laughs> right. Uh, so so my magazine is, is right up there, because I'm, I've been obviously very much in the, in the midst of making final edits, all that stuff. Um, it's front of mind. Yes. Industry-wide, honestly, the, the first word that comes to mind is just concern. Okay. There are a lot of talented, independent journalists out there. The issue is finding them. Finding them as far as a consumer, as someone who consumes news? Yes. Regardless of if it's me, there are independent journalists out there that are 100% worth supporting, mm -hmm. uh, who are doing amazing work. I think a lot of them have kind of taken over a route similar to what I'm trying mm -hmm. uh, and kind of going off on their own just because the situation at larger corporations, as in a lot of industries, has, have kind of become untenable in a lot of ways. If you find a journalist that you like, that you respect their work, please consider supporting them. Losing good journalists is dangerous in a lot of ways. If we don't have people holding people in this industry accountable the nonsense that has gone on for decades with like the harassment, even with the layoffs and the lack of stability for game developers, none of that's going to change if no one's there to shine a light on the issues. Yeah. So I, I would implore you to find those journalists who you who, who are good and great and please support them. That's an excellent statement right there. I 100% agree. The things that I think of are more goofy. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I don't know if I'll share them. We need some silly. We need some silly at the end. <laughs> okay, good. The first thing I think of is Futurama. Yeah. <laughs> where Farnsworth always says, good news, everyone. <laughs> you know, there's that. And then the other one is, I sent you this great space coaster, which was a syndicated sort of uh, series that I would see uh, when I was younger, back in the 80s. It was on for five years, from 1981 to 1986. It was sort of a children's variety show kind of thing, where they would do little skits. I always mistakenly thought it was Sid and Marty Croft, Uh because they had a lot of puppetry and whatnot. But no, this is actually a show that was co-created by Kermit Love, one of the original Muppet designers and builders for Jim Henson, and Jim Martin, who later went on to work on a number of Henson-related projects like Sesame Street. So it was Gary Gnu. He had a program. Every episode, he would do something where he would talk about no Gnu's. It would just <laughs> not be news. It was like the opposite of what you would think of a news program. So he's he's like, I'm not talking about any news on this news show. <laughs> <laughs> And he would say, no Gnu's is good Gnu's on Gary Gnu. <laughs> I love it. Do you remember that at all? Or is that a little bit before your time? I think it's a little bit before your time. A little bit, a little bit before my time. Yeah. It, it was a, one of those silly, silly kind of kids variety shows. They had a, a plot that generally it was about three singers or musicians who were brought onto a, an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> a space coaster oh geez you can't make this stuff up no you can make this stuff up ai can't make yeah. this stuff up but yeah. so that's what i think of i think now we can wrap up the show we had the silly at the end unless you want to talk about something else no that works we can leave people with a smile that works yeah let's do that you know there is such thing as good news you need the stories that are the positive stories and i hope that alongside When we talked the last time, I know that you said you wanted to have that kind of balance with your publication. Yes. You have the hard-hitting investigative, but then there's also some celebratory, this is an amazing industry and here's why kind of stories. Yes. There would be some people who would call them, I guess, puff pieces, but I don't think that's necessarily accurate. I think it's still newsworthy because it shows the, the positivity of the industry. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So in addition to, to some of the hard-hitting pieces, we're get, we'll have some profiles, mm-hmm. you know, some feature stories. It was important for us to highlight the diversity and voices in the gaming industry and to highlight that there's good work being done, right? There, mm-hmm. there are people who have overcome things um, and, and you know, it, it's, it's why people love reading or, or watching biographies about people, you know, and, and kind of learning about what they overcame, what they've learned, and how, you know, that might inspire that next generation of developers or actors or or whoever to keep going and keep pushing through. A story, actually, that comes to mind from someone who actually just put out a game uh, this year, Billy Basso, who put out Mm -hmm. uh, Animal Well. I had a chance to meet him last year at PAX and talk to him a little bit. And we talked about how the documentary indie game, the movie kind of inspired him in a way to do his own game. He was working on mobile stuff for a little while, and then he kind of got disheartened with the whole transactionalized kind of, it was more about, they they put more effort into the storefront than they did the actual game. There was like one person who worked on the actual game mechanics in this Mortal Kombat mobile sort of thing, or maybe it was Injustice, but did you ever see Indie Game the movie? Have you seen that? I did. It's amazing. It's fantastic. It is an interesting, you can have your opinions about the people involved, but it's just a fascinating sort of investigation of completely different sort of perspectives on gaming, different inspirations, how these things were made. And even in a time when Indie Games were still pretty new, People were starting to really get into that, maybe even before Steam really started to take off as far as indie publishers were concerned. So audience, if you haven't seen Indie Game the movie, that's definitely something really worthwhile, worth seeing. 100%. Two thumbs up from us. Two thumbs up. (laughs) Well, four thumbs up if we're including all of our thumbs. Did I just date myself? (laughs) We're the new Siskel and Ebert. 
And then um, your issue of Game On, first issue, you have some web stories up there right now, or is it going to all be put out at the same time on July 16th, did you say, or 15th? The 15th is, is um, and, and there, there are some posts up right now, um, so we'll continue. We're still kind of figuring out the cadence on, on how often for the web post, but there's already content up on the web, okay. uh, so uh, no matter when you listen to this, there'll be stuff up there. Gotcha. Uh, you say we, is this, I, I still thought that this is just a you. Oh, I, okay. <laughs> it, is, it is mainly just me. Uh, I say we, I, I'm manifesting a future team. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Also, so officially it, it's just me, but I mean, my fiance has been super supportive and helpful. Awesome. Um, yeah. And, and, and I'll, I'll say this, that so many people have reached out and offered to help and support in various ways. So even though officially it's just me, it is definitely still been a community effort here in a lot of ways so absolutely it takes a village it, it doesn't feel right to say just just me <laughs> right i wasn't making fun by the way i was just no oh good oh yeah. good <laughs> i don't it, it it generally is confusing and and i've had multiple people be like oh do you have a team i'm like well i mean <laughs> i am the team yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. people say there's no i in team not this one <laughs> there is a me <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> so Thank you, Lucas, so much for joining me on this week's episode. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to be here. And I hope you'll consider doing it again. Hope you had fun. And we'll uh, be looking out for all the amazing news stories that you put out in the future. All the best luck to you, man. If you haven't followed him on social media, definitely do that. I see you active on threads a lot. Well, first of all, thank you for having me back. It's it's always a joy. Thank you for all the flexibility. And I would love to come back whenever uh, you find something that you think fits for me. I'm, I'm totally game for it. Um, and then you too as, as well. Keep that in mind. I mean, we can talk about any topic. I'm, I'm up for the task. We did, we did the word equivocate recently. And then we also did the word aliquot. Oh my goodness. We're up for challenges here at the show. I love it. I said we too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say this as as just a quick aside about threads i actually do love threads i think it's my most it's not my my quote biggest community but i feel like it's my most engaged like i feel like people maybe it's because it's still newer but i feel like we're still in that spot where people are actually interacting more i do love threads yeah i do too and it's and it's also very customizable i mean the stuff that we want to see we can see and the stuff that is toxic we've got some flexibility as far as shielding ourselves from that kind of thing and i think that's something that is not really i mean there's too m- anyway let's not talk about elon musk and how he doesn't know what a truck is um <laughs> we are not sponsored by threads but um yes. i'll speak for myself i'm open to it <laughs> <Just kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> me too i met some co- really cool people recently on threads that i'm hoping to have on as guests so keep an eye out for that one who's uh, really doing a lot of writing as far as Generation X sort of centric topics. Um, that's kind of a, a fun thing. And we could probably have some conversations about video games in that time and arcades and, and things of that nature, mostly pop culture stuff. And then an author that I reached out to that hopefully we can connect with him and get him on the show. So, And then, of course, I've got penny arcade expo coming up that's going to be exciting are you going to penny arcade expo this year or no i am not have you been before no i haven't actually oh you really should check it out one of these times it's a lot of fun it's a show for fans of games so there are a lot of people very diverse sort of environment as far as people and developers that you can check out there really Mm -hmm. cool definitely would be something I think you should consider for future story opportunities even. I love it. And if I make any connections there and I can send them your way, I definitely will do that as well. So oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, audience, for joining us on this week's episode of the Too Vague Podcast. My name is Ben. My name is Lucas. And we've been your hosts. Have a wonderful night. Bye. Hey, Too Vague listeners, this is Andrew, your Partly Robot Industries guy, letting you know that if you want to get one of those Too Vague podcast t-shirts, here is the URL to type into the thingy on the internet. It's tpublic.com slash user slash partly dash robot dash industries. That's right. 
ppublic.com slash user slash partly dash robot dash industries. If that's not confusing enough, Ben might put in a link in the show notes. Follow it.